This is Laura London, and you're listening to Speaking of Jung. Joining us today for episode 103 is Jungian analyst and instructor Art Funkhauser in Bern, Switzerland. Born in 1940 in Evansville, Indiana, he grew up in Oklahoma City and went on to attend the Massachusetts Institute of Technology, known as MIT, where he graduated with a bachelor's degree in physics in 1962. While in graduate school at the University of Michigan, he became involved with early work in coherent optics and holography and earned a master's degree in science and engineering in 1967. After working in research at the National Bureau of Standards in Washington and as an instructor at the Learning Community in Honolulu and the Hellenic International School in Athens, he settled in Zurich and began training as a Jungian analyst at the C.G. Jung Institute. During that time, he worked as a physicist at the Institute for Biomedical Technology and at the Photographic Institute at the ETH, the Swiss Federal Institute of Technology in Zurich, where he completed his doctoral work, earning a Ph.D. in digital picture processing in 1979. After working for a time as a programmer in the ETH's astronomy department, he graduated with a diploma in analytical psychology, the degree of a Jungian analyst, from the C.G. Jung Institute Zurich in 1981. His dissertation was on déjà vu and déjà rêve, which is the subject of part two of this interview, coming next week. Dr. Funkhauser also continued his work as a physicist in the eye department at the Insel Hospital in Bern, Switzerland, until 1993. Since 1989, he has led a seminar in dream work at the Jung Institute Zurich, a lab course for analysts in training. He is one of the founding members of the International Association for the Study of Dreams and has led workshops in dream work in Australia, Switzerland, and the United States. Dr. Funkhauser is the originator and co-director of a research project into the effects of dream telling, supported by two grants from the Swiss National Science Foundation. He has published over 50 scientific papers and a book chapter in the fields of holography, parametry, dream research, and deja experience. Please visit our website, speakingofjung.com, where you'll find links to everything discussed in this episode. This video interview is being recorded on Wednesday, February 9th, 2022, through the magic of StreamYard. Dr. Funkhauser, thank you so much for joining us today. You're very welcome. Happy to be here virtually. <laughs> so, where shall we begin? You graduated, I noticed from the Jung Institute in Zurich in 1981, the same year as my previous guest, Dr. Nancy Qualls Corbett. And I'm going to start off by asking you the same question I asked her. What do you remember about that time? Um, we began our training in, I began in 73 in the original building where the psychological club is, where uh, mm -hmm. Professor Jung had his practice. Um, and that was where the, the Jung Institute was housed until about four or five years later when it moved to Kusnacht into a building up the street for, from where Jung had his home. So I began training in one place and then ended up receiving my diploma in a different town mm -hmm. okay <laughs> yeah but it was a small it was like a family we had we had it was uh it was a relatively small group who began training when i did and it has grown from there it's grown from there and i noticed that well unlike a lot of americans who who trained in zurich you actually remain there and I was wondering, how is it different today, the Jung Institute, than it was back then? Because you, you teach there now. Yes, yes. <laughs> uh, the program is broader. Uh, 
we're, as I said, in a, in a different building, a very fancy one. Um, the, the, it's, of course, with the pandemic, a lot of things have moved online. We're doing a lot with Zoom and uh, my dream seminar. Many of the courses are all held on Zoom now. Are they? Okay. And, uh, but this has the advantage that people from uh, further reaches around the world can take part. Right. If they can manage with the time zones. And uh, so I think it's it's broadened the, 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 uh, the number of people and and the diversity of the people who, who are mm -hmm. able to take part now. Mm -hmm. uh, they don't have to fly to Zurich and, and be there. Mm -hmm. Are you ever there at the Institute? I mean, I, I visited once and it's this really lovely old, very old home. I think it was built in the 1600s, if I'm not mistaken. Oh, and yeah, yeah. it's there in Kusnacht on the lake. And do, do you ever go there now? Recently, I was there in the fall for one dream seminar mm -hmm. in German on a Saturday. Mm -hmm. uh, but that's that was the first time in a long time because everything has been shut down and locked down and we weren't yeah. able to travel. And the trains are, are have become kind of dangerous places for spreading the, the virus. Right. And so I've been reluctant to go, actually. Mm -hmm. Well, I'd like to take this opportunity to mention that the 75th anniversary of the C.G. Jung Institute Zurich uh, will take place next year. And they have announced an international interdisciplinary three day conference mm -hmm. on the topic of emotions and its relevance for analytical psychology. And they're now accepting proposals for papers from all fields related to the study of emotion and its impact on culture, the inner world, creativity, healing, science, and politics. And I mention this now because the submission deadline is February 28th of this year, 2022. And if you go to speakingofyoung.com, uh, right now on the main page, there is a link for you to click on with more information on how to uh, submit your paper. And there will be a link in the show notes uh, for this episode. And I was wondering if you would tell us a little bit about it. Sure. Um, we set to work uh, putting together this call for papers. There's a group of us who are going to be judging the presentations to see which ones fit into the program and we'll have to put the program together. Um, the, the, the Jung Institute, it, it probably needs to be said, has a German-speaking division and an English-speaking division in Kusnacht. And then there's a French-speaking part of the Institute in okay. Lausanne. And uh, this conference is being basically organized by the English speaking people who are associated with the Institute now on the faculty. The German speaking uh, people are going to be contributing. Uh, they're helping us, but they also have their other projects that they're working on. Mm -hmm. So I'd like to go back in time now um, to your very interesting background, uh, your time at MIT and the radar optics lab at the University of Michigan. You went from working as a physicist to practicing as a Jungian analyst. And I know a little bit about your story, but you told me when we spoke a couple months ago that there was more to the story and I still don't know what that is. So take us back to the beginning, because one of the things that I love to do on this podcast is ask analysts how they got to where they are today, because it is a long road and it is a narrow path and it's not easy and it's always interesting. So I thought that I would ask you to go into more detail about it because your story is fascinating to me. Well, if we start with <clears throat> MIT, um, mm -hmm. I worked there for a, a 
instructor who had set up a project to measure the velocity of light using a big microwave cavity. And we were using uh, optics in that project. And then uh, he received a um, promotion or a, a call to be a professor at the University of Michigan. And he asked me if I wanted to join him there after I finished my degree, and I did. And that got me to Michigan. And lo and behold, I ended up in a lab which was the beginning of, of uh, what's called off-axis holography. And um, this has all been written up in a, in a wonderful book uh, on the history of holography. Uh, and uh, yeah, it, it, it was a, a great time. Anytime you turned a hologram around or upside down, you could publish a new paper because everything was new. Uh, Would you tell us the name of that book? Uh, just a second. Oh. It's called Holographic Visions. Nice. Okay, great. I'll provide a link to that in the show notes. It's put out, published by the Oxford University Press. Ah. It says A History of a New Science. And the author is uh, S E A and John, I guess Johnston. So it's it's. I contributed a photo in there. <laughs> you contributed a photo in there. A, a photo of what? Of our lab group for ah. that back then. Yes. So where did we leave off? You you were doing, you told me you were doing some classified work too. Well, yes, at that time, uh, it was it was called side looking radar. Uh, and I was very grateful for that work because it kept me out of Vietnam. <laughs> uh, well, I, I, I can explain how it works, but I think that would take us too far. Side looking <laughs> radar, just in general, what is it it's you said that it was being used to map today being used to map the surface of venus yes, mm -hmm. yes. so it works on the principle that the resolution you achieve depends on how big your your antenna is and it's one point somebody realized that if you fly an airplane on a straight path and collect the data as you fly along you can synthesize uh, uh, an antenna of enormous length and achieve unbelievable ground resolution in, mm. the, in the pictures that you get. And that's what's being used now to map the surface of Venus, mm. the satellite going around. Mm -hmm. So your early work in holography, um, can you tell us anything about that? As far as, I don't know, kind of your interest in it did you did you fall into it and well, does the, the it... Way, well yes in a way but mm -hmm. it became possible because of the invention of the laser of the of the helium neon gas laser before that uh, the holograms which had been made by gabor in london were very very crude because he, he didn't have a coherent light source except mm -hmm. uh, yes <laughs> Is this, there's too much technical detail. <laughs> there's a lot of technical detail. And I'm just um, trying to uh, let the listeners know where you came from and your background and how that influences the work you did today. And also, I just want to let the listeners know uh, or the viewers know, because this is the second time I am recording video on Speaking of Young. Speaking of Young is almost seven years old now, and I just started doing video this year with episode 100 with James Hollis, and some of the other guests have, have elected not to do video, but Dr. Funkhauser was brave enough to be my second test subject. And so you'll see me writing. That's how I compile the show notes is uh, whenever my guest mentions a book or a talk or a paper or a conference, I write it down uh, so that you can listen freely and not have to take notes during the show. 
and then I add them to the web page uh, with links so that you have easy access to whatever my guests mentioned. So yeah, I don't want to, I guess, talk too long about things that the listeners, uh, the Jungians out there might might not be as interested in, but I'm, I'm trying to establish how you went from working as a physicist to then changing career paths. Um, because I think it's a, it's an inspiration to people who might feel stuck in the, whatever career they're in right now and it doesn't suit them and they don't listen to that and they stay in it for the rest of their lives and they're miserable. So right. I'd like to hear how and why you changed career paths. Oh, okay. Um, so from the work on holography, I then uh, got a job at the Bureau of Standards, which at that time was outside uh, Washington, D.C. in Maryland. Well, they're still there, but they changed their name. Mm -hmm. And uh, I was beginning a Ph.D. at Georgetown University in physics that they were paying for, but the classes were in the evening, and uh, which meant I could work during the day and go to the class in the evening, which was fine. But what, well, something very strange was happening to me. I, I would go to my class. The course was quantum mechanics, which has always been very difficult for me. Mm -hmm. And I would go to sleep. Huh. Before the instructor walked in, I would go to sleep. Hmm. And this continued uh, evening after evening. Uh, just I was out. And I began to think, this is strange. This, this, this shouldn't. I was doing everything I could think of to stay awake, and it just wasn't working. So I went up the hall at the university, and I sat in on a lecture uh, uh, on theories of personality. Mm. And there I was wide awake. Mm. And I'll never forget his lecture on Jung. He, he said, uh, Jung, nobody understands Jung. He's far too complicated, but I love him. He's great. <laughs> I love that. That was basically his lecture on you. Yeah. <laughs> Meanwhile, yeah. I was involved. This was this was the hippie era in counter groups and so on. And I was involved in such a group. And there was a fellow there who had been quite active and suddenly he wasn't around anymore. And I began to ask, well, whatever happened to Tom? And they said, oh, he's over in Zurich studying at the Jung Institute. Oh. And so I wrote him and I said, Tom, tell me about it. Do you recommend it? And I got back a postcard which said, Art, sell what you have to and get over here as fast as you can. Wow. <laughs> it took me two years of getting my affairs in order. And in 71, I set off for Zurich. But, but first stop was Hawaii. Mm -hmm. And from Hawaii to Japan and India and Sri Lanka and uh, Iran and Russia. Wait, and wait, what were you doing in all those countries? I was with a group and we were studying meditation. Oh. With, with a guru. Oh, what kind of meditation? Uh, he called it Raja Yoga. Okay. It, it's basically Hindu. Mm hmm. Raja Yoga. Yes. Raja meaning, means royal. Mm. So you traveled around and you practiced and practicing yoga. That, and, mm -hmm. Yes, a lot of that was, was uh, a lot of kundalini uh, theory was involved mm -hmm. in what we were doing. And we would have meditation uh, days in Japan. We had in meditation days in Sri Lanka. And during our time in India, we even had an audience with the, Dal with the Dalai Lama mm. in Dharamsala. So that was all very impressive. And, but basically, I was on my way to Zurich. Mm. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I got to Zurich, my uh, future training analyst, who was also a former physicist named Arnie Mendel, mm -hmm. said, Art, you have to come back in a year's time. I'm full at the moment. And that's how I ended up in Greece teaching school. <laughs> ah, okay. So you were just kind of hanging around, doing what you could, waiting. 
yeah. to yeah. and and the whole that whole time those years uh you still wanted to pursue studying Jung and Jungian psychology nothing told you that you know maybe I shouldn't do this no no it was it was clear that was what I was going to do it was clear during all that yoga all that meditation all that traveling you knew that entire time that you were going in that direction yes yeah so is there is there more to the story or do you yeah, do... I'll be happy to tell you <laughs> mm -hmm. uh, I, uh, while I, in that first time, in 72, I made contact with a fellow, a professor doing research with lasers. Uh, and it was called biomedical technology because he was uh, working on bone uh, torsion and looking at stresses and strains in bone using lasers. Okay. So I, I said, if I'm going away for a year. When I come back, would it be possible for me to have a position with your group? And he said, sure. <laughs> so I, I went off to Greece and uh, rode him a couple times back and forth. When I got back to Zurich, um, I walked into the Jung Institute and, and uh, the woman behind the desk, her name was Hedy Baumann, um, said, oh, I'm so sorry, Mr. Funkhauser, while you were away, Switzerland has clamped down on the number of foreigners, foreigners who are allowed into the country. Oh. And uh, we're only allowed to take 15 new students each semester. And our, we're, already, we're full. We, we, you come back in three years time, we'll, we'll let you begin your studies. Three years. Yes, they were that, that full already. So um, I then went up to the professor and I said to him, um, I'm here. <laughs> and he said, oh, well, we stopped that uh, laser research. He said, the only position I could offer you would be one to do data entry into a PDP computer during the night. Because if you'll do that, then we can use the computer during the day. The computer belongs to the blood and urine uh, lab, uh, but they let us use it during the day if you do that entry during the night. So I said, and, and I was desperate. I had no okay. money. So for 10 francs a night, uh, or an hour, sorry, 10 francs an hour, okay. willing to, to do this. And um, uh, he said, okay. So he called an assistant and they, we were sent down to the police to get my work permit. And the guy in the office said, no way. He's an American. He can go home anytime. Uh, we're concerned with people from Eastern Europe who need work and need jobs. So no, no work permit for him. And we went back to the professor and told him. And then I learned how things work in Switzerland. He, he got on the phone and called the head of the police and said, I need this guy. Mm. And the police guy said, well, is he a student? We could make an exception for a student. Ah. And the professor looked at me and asked me, are you a student? And I said, well, I would like to be at the Jung Institute. Mm -hmm. And he said, okay, you go to the Jung Institute and bring back a paper saying you're a student there and you can work for us. <laughs> wow. So I went back to the Jung Institute walked in and she almost hugged me. She said, oh, I'm so glad you came back. Mr. Funkhauser, someone just called us from the States who cannot come. So we have an empty slot. You can be, you can start immediately as a, you know, in the training. Mm -hmm. I went into the hall outside her office and there was a, a, a fellow student, um, Bob Henshaw. And oh. he, he said, uh, you're new here, aren't you? I said, yes. He said, well, I'm leaving a room just up the street. You can have my room. Oh, great. And I went down to back to, to the Institute for Biomedical Technology, and I began my job that night. <laughs> so you're, you're talking about Robert Hinshaw, who I've mentioned yeah. on this podcast a lot. He uh, is a Jungian analyst who I met in Zurich, and he uh, owns a publishing company called 
Daimon Furlog. Yes. And he's published a lot of books. And uh, hopefully uh, he's going to be a guest on this podcast because he's one of the editors on the upcoming uh, original protocols of Memories, Dreams, Reflections. So uh, so Dr. Hinshaw was leaving. Uh, you took his place. He wasn't leaving the Institute. He was only leaving that room. Leaving the room. OK, great. So you hung out with him. And um, who else? Daryl Sharp. Did you know Daryl? Yes. Well, mm -hmm. we. I was busy picketing my doing this night work. Okay. And trying to get enough sleep and get and be in my classes, so I didn't have much time for socializing. <laughs> but yes, uh, Daryl Sharp was there. Uh, Terry McBride was there in Sydney, who's now in Sydney. Um, Gary well, Sharp. Sorry. Gary Sharp. Gary Sharp. Yes. Yes. Right. Linda so, Cohen, who passed, who recently passed away, unfortunately, I just learned of that. Oh. Um, and and who were some of the your instructors, your your training analysts? We had uh, Mary Louise von Franz. We had Barbara Hanna. So you studied with them. Uh, Ribi, yes, yes, yes. Oh. Yeah, Mary uh, Mary Louise uh, was the examiner on my my uh, fairy tale examination mm. and almost flunked me because i didn't know anything about alchemy at the time <laughs> what what can you tell us about her chiron publications is currently in the process of publishing her collected works yes. and they've published three volumes already and volume six will be published next month on march 15th and it is on Nicholas von Flew and uh, Saint Perpetua. Perpetua? I don't know how to pronounce that correctly. How would you say it? I would say Perpetua. Perpetua. And uh, an analyst that joined me when I first started this podcast back in 2015, Frith Luton in Melbourne, Australia. Um, she had Daryl Sharp publish her book, and she mentioned Von Flew a lot in that book. So I asked Frith to uh, do an episode with me about that volume, and we're going to be doing an episode in mid-March. But what can you tell us about Von Franz, since you uh, knew her? She was intense. Intense. Okay. Uh, she was totally in into what she was doing. Mm -hmm. And uh, she did not, uh, she had little patience with, with people who didn't think <laughs> clearly. Okay. Um, she told us an interesting story one time, though, and she said she and Barbara Hanna shared an apartment. Yeah. And uh, one time, uh, Mary Louise came home, and uh, here was Barbara Hanna standing at the top of the stairs, and she had a whole pile of uh, ceramic dishes that she had gone out and purchased mm -hmm. at all of the, the Goodwill stores she mm -hmm. could find. And she told Mary Louise, now I want you to throw these down the steps one at a time. Wow and make as much noise as you can mm. and she did it she mm -hmm. said that at the beginning it was it was difficult but after a while she got into it and she was really enjoying smashing all these these dish these uh plates i would love to do that i need that yeah yes <laughs> yeah some people throw eggs at trees or um, there, I think I saw recently, come to think of it, on a television show where there is a place that you can go and put on safety goggles and they have all this old, like the old tube televisions and the big console TVs and old computers and sledgehammers and you just smash stuff. I've forgotten about that. Thank you for bringing that up because I need that right about now. <laughs> a punching bag is not bad. <laughs> punching bag. Yeah, I used to, before COVID, I was working with a trainer uh, who was an MMA fighter and we were doing kickboxing. 
That will do it. That was very strenuous, and I was in great shape, and I really missed that. So, another another mm-hmm. good solution is get into your car, roll up the windows, uh, have it parked somewhere where there aren't people going to watch, mm-hmm. and you grab the steering wheel and you can scream and you can hit the seat beside you. Just don't have it turned on. <laughs> And you can oh. let off let out an enormous amount of energy that way. Screaming in a car. That's a great idea. Yep. Yeah. Yep. We usually sing in the I car. Serve anyone. Right. Great and idea. Where everybody has to be quiet. It's, it's a good, good solution. So why do you think Barbara Hanna uh, suggested that to Dr. Von Franz? She recognized her a lot of pent up aggression that needed okay. to come out. Mm-hmm. Uh, and so you had them as your instructors and now you are an instructor. And I'd like to now start discussing the topic of this episode, which is Jungian dream work, because you told me you teach a lab course at the Jung Institute. Would you tell us what a lab course is? Oh, we use the dreams of the people who come. So we're doing active dream work in the course. With each other, everybody gets to hear the dream. And then you, you, where do you pick up from there? Well, first I've given them instructions. Mm -hmm. And we work with uh, what I call everyday dreams. Uh, Not... uh, big dreams, not okay. archetypal dreams. And what's the difference between an everyday dream and a big, what Jung called a big dream? Okay. Uh, well, a big dream is very impressive, feels a bit weird, strange. Mm-hmm. Uh, you cannot, it doesn't, it's not out of your normal everyday experience. Okay. Uh, it can be very symbolic. Uh, one lady told me once a dream in which she uh, was standing in front of a like a cathedral and the doors opened and she went in and but in the middle of this cathedral there was a hu- a big round hole and a low wall around the hole and this made her curious because you don't normally see things like that in mm-hmm. cathedrals so she went and looked down, and there was the devil looking up at her. And that shocked her so much that it woke her up. I hope you you feel that this is not the, the kinds of dreams that people normally have. Mm-hmm. Uh, but those are the kinds of dreams that are the most fascinating, and you can, you can uh, approach them... Uh, with all of your knowledge about various uh, meanings of symbols. And uh, as it turned out, in her case, she had been rela- raised in a very strict, narrow uh, church family. Mm-hmm. And there was, in fact, something very negative in, in her spirituality that we needed to talk about. Mm-hmm. Uh Everyday dreams are much, much more just normal. In your dream, you're you're uh, involved with people that that you may know uh, in places that seem somewhat familiar. Mm-hmm. You could even dream that you go to the local grocery store and get a can of beans off the shelf. I mean, mm-hmm. the, these right. are what I call everyday dreams. The mm-hmm. kinds of people tend to ignore. On the other hand, if you're a, an analyst, these are the dreams that people bring you because, because these are the ones that people are having about mm-hmm. 80 to 90 percent of the time. Mm-hmm. So I want I, I teach uh, how people can work with those kinds of dreams. And by the way, I need to, to say here that I learned this from Arnie Mendel. He was the one who taught us how to work with these kinds of dreams. I just want to tell tell us a little bit about Arnie Mandel. 
You mentioned him before. Would you tell us a little bit more about him? He was also a former physicist. Uh, he was my training analyst. He was the one who told me to come back in a year's time. Mm -hmm. um, he had finished his training only a couple years before I did. He, he was American, uh, had also been to the MIT. Uh, he was from Schenectady. I can't even say the word. Schenectady. Yeah, New York. Mm -hmm. Uh, he now lives in Oregon, uh, outside Portland. Mm -hmm. I think the name of the town is Yashots. Uh, and he gives courses still all over the world. Courses on? Psychology. Uh, he calls it world work instead mm -hmm. of dream work. World uh, work. What, what, what does he mean by that? I, I would recommend that you interview him and get him to explain it. Okay. I'm, I'll yeah. definitely, I'll definitely try to do that. Yes. He, so, he, was, mm -hmm. he, he originated uh, as a result of his Jungian training. He, he originated what he, what came to be known as process oriented psychology. Mm -hmm. And that's now being taught uh, worldwide. So you base how you teach Jungian dream work at the Institute on what he taught you. And, well, and, and, and we had a group of people who were, who were being trained and we went off on, on weekend uh, retreats with him and we, we worked on each other's dreams together. Mm -hmm. So what I'm doing is, is, is derived from, from those experiences. Mm -hmm. So I want to cover a few of the basics, um, briefly touch on, does everyone dream? What happens when we dream? Where are dreams coming from? Why do, I don't know if it's most people, I would say most people, but you have more experience uh, with this than I do. I would say most people don't remember their dreams and I'd like to just cover some of those basics before we get more in depth on the process of analyzing dreams. Fine. Could you go through those one at a time? Sure. So does everyone dream? Uh, all warm blooded uh, animals have REM phases, rapid eye movement phases. Okay. Um, when you wake someone up from a REM phase, they can often relate a dream that they were having. Mm. And for a long time, one said, oh, that's the dream phase of sleep. Right. Uh, but in deep sleep, in the non-REM phase, uh, if you wake people up very carefully, they will also tell you about dreams that they were having. Mm -hmm. So now we say uh, we're dreaming all the time and Jung believes, and I also believe it, that we're dreaming 24 hours a day. We're constantly dreaming. It's just that we're not aware of it during the day most of the time. Um, so since everybody has REM phases, the theory is uh, everybody dreams. But you... <laughs> I find it difficult because you you can't ask everybody if they dream, <laughs> but this is an assumption. Mm -hmm. uh, on the other hand, as you say, a lot of people don't remember their dreams mm -hmm. and that's more the problem. What would make us not remember a dream? Uh, alarm clocks. <laughs> Waking up suddenly and kind yes. of forcefully. Our alarm clocks are dream killers, <laughs> mm. and people people who have kids and they have to get up and they have to get moving and they have to get the breakfast made and they certainly have to get to the toilet. Um, that's their attention and their thinking is already on that, and no time to think about dreams. Mm. There have been studies done on dream recall, and um, Dream, dream recall seems to be best uh, among people up to uh, age 26 or so 
but after that it declines rapidly as people enter the workforce and only mm. begins to to improve after people are retired huh. so the next question is what happens when we dream what what's going on there what is that oh well, it, it, we're we're uh, we have a it's like opening the, the the hood of the car and looking at the inside, mm. seeing what's going on underneath uh, our psyches in the unconscious, what issues it's dealing with. Uh, a lot of it has to do with the digestion of what went on the day before. Uh, some of it is. Uh, the preparation for what's coming up. As anybody who's been to university knows, they have a dream of going to that important examination and they forgot the book or they forgot the paper or they forgot to turn the paper over or they don't have what they need for the exam. And by golly, the next day they have everything they need because the dream showed them how, mm -hmm. how horrible it is not to have what you need. Mm -hmm. the, the, <clears throat> the, the typical Swiss dream is uh, similar to this, is uh, missing the train, getting to the train station, <clears throat> and the train you need is moving out. Excuse me, I'm going to have to have some. Sure, go ahead. And so uh, I, I have to say, I don't have dreams like that, and I always wondered why. My dreams are, they're so strange to me, you know, and I don't dream about my life. I'm usually somewhere else, but I don't want to digress into that. So from your, my question is from your experience, do most people dream about those, those uh, kind of mundane everything, every, everyday things? And if, if not, if, what does that say about us? So that's, that's what I'm trying to get to is, do different people have different types of dreams and those will be the kinds of dreams they have their whole life? Or will will everyone have a wide variety of different types of dreams? I have a great uh, reservation of making generalizations. Yeah. Um, uh, I think all of the above. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> no, I laugh because my analyst used to say that to me all the time. She'd say, that's a sweeping generalization, Laura. Yes. And uh, you reminded me of that. I'm still, you know, we, we, we always have our stuff. So, okay. Um, why, so why do some people remember their dreams? Other people don't. Uh, and I would suspect that nobody would enter into analysis or into training to become an analyst if they think they don't dream. I, I was actually watching um, the, speaking of Marie-Louise von Franz, the um, film, I guess it, it's called a film that she made with Fraser Boa, The Way of the Dream. Yes. And Fraser was interviewing people on the street and this one guy said, I don't dream. Right. And and he laughed when when Fraser said he was making a documentary about dreams. He laughed and said, "Why would anybody do that?" So, people who say I don't dream, it's because they're not remembering their dreams. Right? That's Dreaming right. is a natural biological process. Yes, and um, about thirty percent of the population claims that they they don't dream. And I, I, I don't want to neglect to mention this. I'm going to mention it now. You are part of an international organization, um, looking here for the exact name of it again, on the study of dreams. It yeah. is in, based in Petaluma, California, the International Association for the Study of Dreams. And let's just take this opportunity now for you to tell us about that, what that is and how you became involved. Okay. Uh, in your introduction, you said I was a founding member. That's not quite true. Okay. Uh, Sorry. <laughs> uh, I, I came along. It had been in existence about 10 years before I finally began going to the conferences. Okay. 
the first conference I went to was held in, in Holland, in Leiden. I'm not sure that's that Holland. In, in any case, the Netherlands. Okay. <laughs> and uh, uh, I was hooked. I really liked this bunch of people. Oh, hang on, and, Dr. Uh, Falkhauser, yeah. hang on, hang on, you were, you were cutting out a little bit, so I'm going to have to ask you to repeat that. Okay, my, the first uh, conference of the organization that I attended was in Leiden, in the Netherlands, and I really liked the people there and, uh, and what they were doing and talking about, and, and I was hooked, and mm. I asked that I, I made sure I attended the conferences, most of which were in the U.S., but that was okay because that gave me an excuse to go to the U.S. and visit family mm -hmm. and uh, attend the conferences. Mm -hmm. So, uh, who, who's in this in this uh, organization? It's not just Jungians, right? No, no. Mm -hmm. In fact, uh, we're in the minority. In the minority, okay. We have people who are. Uh, uh, dentists and dancers. There's a large contingent who are artists, um, but we also have Harvard professors, uh, people doing dream research, uh, from in various, uh, and they they have a subgroup where they they share their research results. But what's great about it is that there isn't uh, industrial grant money involved. Mm. Pharma industry is not interested. They're, they're very interested in helping people sleep, but not interested in helping people dream. So there's no competition for grant money in this in this organization. And that okay. makes it very relaxed and and like a big family. I just I would just like to uh, reiterate the point you just made about the pharmaceutical industry being more interested in helping people sleep and not necessarily in helping people dream. And I've never taken a sleep aid. Um, my, I suspect that it would suppress dreaming. Is that true? Uh, as far as I know, yes, but I don't, I'm not really knowledgeable okay. of the exceptions. <laughs> okay. Okay, so these a very uh, kind of not eclectic, but a, a, a large mixture of of people from a mixture of backgrounds is part of this association. And you guys do research, you get together, you you give talks, you discuss things. Mm -hmm. What is some of the research that's being done today? Um, I'll... I'm most familiar with the work that Michael Schradel is doing up mm -hmm. in Alnheim. Uh, he's principally interested in, in showing how the continuity hypothesis works out in dreams. He's showing that uh, the things that turn up in dreams, you can trace to things that are, that the person is involved with in their thinking or in their, in their daily lives. And you've written a couple of papers or one paper with uh, Michael Schradel. Yes, yes. Mm -hmm. In fact, uh, uh, two or three. <laughs> okay, and I will provide links to those papers in the show notes. And so what what type of research have you published with him on dreams? Uh, one had to do with uh, um, truck drivers. Mm. Um, we wanted to know if they are driving trucks during the day, all day. Uh, do they also dream of driving trucks? Yeah. And, and they do. And they do. <laughs> yes. So, huh. uh, which in a way contradicts the Jungian idea of compensation. Uh, yeah. And that's, that was my interest to see how strong compensation occurs in their dreams. So why specifically did you guys single out uh, or, or look at truck drivers? Uh, because they they are doing their job uh, pretty much the whole day and doing the same thing pretty much the whole uh, day. Okay. 
Mm, and seeing kind of the same landscapes and yes. going through the same routine and okay so let's talk about compensation because that was one of the questions i wanted to ask you uh is are all dreams compensatory and what does that mean uh, what it means is that if you are in your life or in your attitudes you are too one-sided uh, heading off in one direction which is not really true from where you should be going your dreams will bring up a different a different course as a way of, of creating a balance uh, I, a lot of people might know the term homeostasis it's our our organism's means of making sure we don't get too, too hot or too cold we we keep things in balance and the same is true of the psyche. You, you wrote a lot about this. That, yeah. That, um, dreams will fill in what's missing, for example, in dreams our life. Dreams will fill in what's missing. Mm -hmm. So with the truckers, you found that that wasn't the case. So it wasn't the case. So which, which is to say that not all dreams are compensatory. Okay. <laughs> so then what... What are they? If they're not compensatory, what's going on there? Uh, they can, well, one thing I've learned is when flying across the Atlantic, you and there comes that moment after having the meal, when you turn to your sit, the guy sitting or person sitting next to you, and you ask, oh, what do you do? <laughs> uh -huh. I learned never to say I work with dreams. <laughs> mm. They always have to tell me a dream. Sure. That they've yeah. had. And this can get embarrassing because suddenly you know so much about them that they don't know that they told you. Yeah. <laughs> what do you do with this? And I remember one in particular was a lady returning from a fashion trip in Europe back to her boutique in Florida. And she told me that she just she dreams constantly about her job and about working in the boutique to the point that she wakes up exhausted. Mm. And mm. it's to me that her unconscious had, had decided the only way he, she was, that unconscious was going to get her to stop was to push her into a mental breakdown. Okay. Hmm. I, I tried to, 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 to say, well, maybe you need to slow down a bit. Right. But uh, I don't think I was heard. On another occasion, I, I said something about the person's dream, and she got up and said, you know what, there's a reporter from Time Magazine about three rows up. Let me get him, and we'll all talk about dreams together. <laughs> so uh -huh. it, it can get rather interesting, but I, I decided I'll tell people I'm a nuclear physicist, and that sort of stuff. There you go. Yeah, that'll and, stop and, it. And uh, the, end the conversation right there. Yeah, yeah. nobody cares. <laughs> Right. So let's get back to more of, um, well, maybe we should move on from the basics about dreams because I want to um, go into more of the Jungian um, interpretation of dreams. And dreams are symbolic. And they can be. They can be. Okay. So taking dreams literally. Uh, was what I did before I got into analysis. And I always struggled with looking at it symbolically. And, and when I would take a dream to my analyst and she would bring things out of the dream and it always amazed me. And still today, uh, I'm amazed by it. But there's something that's very important about dream, dream work. Uh, I don't want to say dream interpretation, but dream work. And and I, I'd like for you to tell us why you don't use the term interpretation, um, is that we need the dreamer's input. And so one of the things I like to do with this podcast is, is I'm, I'm very picky about who I interview because I want to uh, bring on guests who are highly educated 
and experienced. So when you go online and you want to understand your dream and you find there, there's so much misinformation out there. So I, I, I don't even know where this started, but uh, we need to unpack all of this. So I'm going to let you talk now on uh, comment on some of the things I just mentioned. Okay. I, I, um, prefer to talk about dream work yeah. and dream interpretation because the classical idea of dream interpretation is that you bring your dream to some expert and he or she tells you what your dream means. Mm. And yeah, we don't want that. No, no. That, okay. That, Tell us why. Uh, because that person has a kind of power that that uh, if you disagree with them, well, that's resistance. You're not you're not agreeing with the experts. So so there's you're not, you're you're being resistant to the to the process. Is the classical I guess Freudian. I doubt that they still do this, but that's that was the the picture one got of Freud in analysis. And in dream work, we're 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 eye to eye we're equal people and we're working on the dream together together okay and this means i have to ask lots of questions mm -hmm. and it's it, there, if there's nothing else that people take away from this podcast <laughs> i would like them to take away two two things two number things. one okay everyone has their own dream language when I dream of a cow, it means something very different than if somebody who milks them every day dreams of a cow. Got it. Okay. The other thing that I would like to, to emphasize that dreams have more than one meaning. So it is, it is criminal to tell somebody that their dream means this because by doing that you exclude all the other meanings okay and that's that's like murder mm. <laughs> in favor of nonviolent dream and dream work mm -hmm. so talk to us about associations uh, when you say your first point uh each person has his or her own dream language yes is that what is going on when an analyst will ask the dreamer, what are your associations to the, the, the various uh, subjects of this dream? Okay. I've come away from using that word. Okay. Because I, it, it could cause the person to start thinking, and I don't want the mm, person thinking. Great the point. Person, it's like remote viewing. Yeah. Remembering. Okay. I want them to, to tell me what that individual or that color or that location reminds them of reminds you of okay uh I mean, this is a way of asking for associations but mm -hmm. i'm just using that word mm -hmm. <laughs> what's equally important is to ask the person about their feeling reactions as they saw that person or that place or that color and by the way when i say that color i i, I don't mean the color just red, but which red? There are many, many different yeah. shades in, of red. So one has to zero, zero in on exactly which red. And then what does, what does, does that red, uh, does the person connect with that red in some way? Mm -hmm. And the person says, oh, you know what? I, I bought a dress last week, which had exactly that shade. Well, okay. Good. Right. And so that's why I just want to interject here. That's a great example. That's why it's not so helpful to grab some sort of dream dictionary written by some random and look up the color red and and understand, oh, that's what that red thing in my dream meant. No. Exactly. No. I've just met with disasters with people who do that. Okay. And invariably, they pick the most negative possible meaning. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. No, no they, those books make good doorstops. <laughs> okay. 
I love that. So everyone has their own dream language and is there, are, did, and their own feeling reactions and their own feeling reactions. When they saw that individual, you, you not only find out was that individual tall or short or fat or thin or dark or light, but you also say, when, how did that feel to you when you saw that person? Yeah. What was and that's what? very important. Yeah. yeah. Equally important. Equally important. Absolutely. And in an, an additional uh, thing to keep in mind is when you hear a dream, you immediately make a picture and your picture is wrong. <laughs> Only the dreamer's picture is right. Ah, okay. So by asking these questions, you, you, are, you are updating your, your version <laughs> and trying to get as close, your picture as close to the dreamer's picture as you can. You as an analyst, yeah. And, and also the feelings. You probably had different feeling reactions to a person who was dressed like that or had that kind of uh, dark hair or light hair or whatever. And so the third thing that you have to keep in mind is your own reactions as a dream worker. As a dream worker, your own reactions to so hearing... Confuse them with the dreamers. Ah. Uh... Otherwise, you'll project your 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 truth, your experiences, your feelings, and assume that the dreamer has those the same ones, and that's very often not true. What we also need to know is what was happening in the person's life when they had the dream. And I I try to to ask that question that broadly, not ask them, not tie it to the dream. Just what was going on in your life that day or what was coming up the next day? So is what we dreamed or dreamt last mm -hmm. night, does that have everything to do with what happened to us yesterday? Or what was coming up? Uh, no. Okay. <laughs> it could well have something <clears throat> totally different, but in... I would. <clears throat> I'm sorry, my vocal cords. That's are okay. Take rough. your time. Uh, tea. Time. Yeah, have some tea. So, yeah, I'm just curious to know if, well, whatever I dreamt last night is what's going on in the psyche right now. And what? What? Well, the, you see that the the unconscious has also the job of sorting through. Store, uh, getting rid of stuff it doesn't need. Uh, there's a, there's a selection process going on. What's what's important? What do I need to retain? What can I forget? Uh, because if you have to remember everything that's going on, like the titles of the books behind me and all in this picture. You just have far too much, so you have. So there's a selection process that goes on as well. That's that's why I say it's a, di a digestion process. Yes, I've heard you say that it's a digestion process, and I just brought up my notepad because when I was listening to von Franz speak, she said something. I wanted to to hear what what you thought of this. She said that the dream always tells us something we don't know. Right. It it always points to a blind spot, and. And uh, she was asked, you know, why do we need an, an analyst to to uh, in, it, to analyze our dreams? And I was thinking about, well, if we need an operation, we have to go to a physician. We can't operate on ourselves. And you're not going to have your neighbor uh, perform open heart surgery on you. You're going to go to someone who's educated and experienced. And von Franz said, you know, how can you see your own back? You can't. And so a dream will will show us our psychological blind spots. Well, if you, um, how to say, we're, we're too close to our dreams. Yeah. yeah. We see the forest for the trees. And when you tell the dream to someone else, and if that someone else has the, the, the interest is interested in us and is and will ask some questions, mm -hmm. 
it, this gives you some distance from the dream. Yeah, and, I remember that in, in analysis. Mm -hmm. Yes, and as you go through the dream with this person, things will come up which will be a surprise. Yeah. And then you've you've touched one of your blind spots, mm. some feeling uh, reaction which you had not paid attention to, for example. Mm. Mm -hmm. So, uh, as we start to wind down here, um, just looking at the time, there's some other topics that I wanted to cover with you. One is lucid dreaming, and the other is precognitive dreaming. And before I became interested in Jung, and before I entered into analysis, I was um, really into the new agey topics. And those were big topics, astral traveling, you know, and do we go somewhere when we dream? Do we actually, the part of us that isn't physical, does it visit another dimension? And and I'm also curious, as a Jungian analyst, how you view precognitive dreams. So those uh, two topics. I certainly uh, believe that they happen. Uh, I had precognitive experiences myself, so I'm totally convinced. That... that, that came to you in a dream or in well, a waking state, but you're saying that they're both the same. Well, some people um, remember their dream and they're all puzzled about it. And then when it comes true, they say, oh, that's what I dreamed about. Or you get people like me who or have a deja vu experience and suddenly know what's going to happen before it does. Yeah. You say, oh, I dreamt this, <laughs> but I didn't remember that dream until right now. Yeah. And we're going to talk about that next week um, yeah. because I wanted to cover your background. Uh, I decided to do this interview with you, Dr. Funkhauser, in two parts. And so next week you're going to return and we are going to spend the whole episode on your research on what you call the deja experience because it it includes more than just deja vu so oh. we're going to save that for next week but and i wanted to focus on dream work uh in this episode um and yes. so precognitive would you say you've ever had a precognitive dream where you dreamt about a situation and then it actually happened in the outside world, in the physical world. I just, I just told you that I've, I've had uh, uh, yeah. these deja vu experiences, which were based on dreams, <clears throat> but okay. I didn't remember the dream. And oh, so, I see what you're saying. Okay, I'm sorry, I misunderstood. Mm -hmm. Yes, um, but there are any number of people who are having precognitive dreams, and on Facebook, there's a group devoted to talking about precognitive dreams. I think, could, could I clarify my question? Um, yeah. I have experienced that too. And again, we're going to talk about it next week where I am having an experience in the physical world and I will realize I dreamt this. Yes, I have had that my whole life to be honest. Uh -huh. But I, I'm thinking about a friend of mine who I actually had on the podcast last year during my quarantine series, who has precognitive dreams, but they're not about herself. They're not about her life. They're about plane crashes. And accident. it was an accident on a movie set. She dreamt those she was not in the dream. She had nothing to do with the dream. Um, so I think that that's what I mean when I say precognitive dream. There are examples of children who drew the World Trade Centers and a plane crashing into them uh, before it happened. Okay. And as, an, as a Jungian analyst, what are your comments on the psyche and that phenomena? I I am just rocked on my feet how how wonderful and how much we don't know about the psyche. Mm -hmm. 
the psyche is just far grander and more wonderful than than we normally give it credit for yeah <coughs> yeah so the other question i had was about lucid dreams yes and i know you're familiar with them you had mentioned to me a couple of books written by ian wilson who is a lucid dreamer and um did you edit those books no well i i I edited, I, at the time that I did the editing, I think he was just going to put it up on, on his website. Okay. And I think he may have then turned it into a book. Yeah, but, the, the Kindle editions are available on Amazon or from Amazon, and I'll provide links to them in the show notes. One is titled, You Are Dreaming, Dream Reality Dyad. And the uh -huh. other is the theory of precognitive dreams. Mm -hmm. So lucid dreams, do you guys talk about those in at the Jung Institute in, in your course? Not so much. Not so uh, much. Okay. I, I have mentioned them, but I very seldom meet someone who, who has actually experienced lucid Really? But while, while we're doing this, let me recommend a book. Okay. Lucid Dreaming, Gateway to the Inner Self. Who yes. wrote that? Oh, Robert Wagner. Robert Wagner, who is a, a longtime member of the Association for the Study of Dreams and has a website devoted to lucid dreaming. This is all about lucid dreaming, uh, hence and, the title. Uh, Stephen Labarge uh, will be giving a talk at the... Uh, this year's conference of the Association for the Study of Dreams. <coughs> okay. And he, he he's, a, I would say, the grandfather of, of the modern lucid dreaming movement. So is this uh, International Association for the Study of Dreams, is lucid dreaming a big topic with them? Uh, yes, yes. Not the main, there isn't a main topic, but it's uh -huh. one of the ones. <laughs> There's a big group interested in that. So I had asked you if, uh, as an analyst, you guys got into that and you said, no, not really. The dreams that the analysts in training bring you uh, to work on in this lab course, they're not lucid dreams. No. So why are some people lucid dreaming? I mean, are, they're, they're lucid dreaming naturally or they're lucid dreaming because they want to be lucid dreaming? Both. Both. <laughs> I mean, well, you have people who seem to have a knack for it. Yeah. And, and others who have to work at it to, to learn how to do it. You, do you, you have an interest in it? Um, sorry? Yeah. I'm sorry. I spoke over you. I apologize. I just said you have the whole spectrum. The whole spectrum, just like with everything else, right? With everything else, yes. So, no, I was wondering if you have an interest in lucid dreaming. Not so much. I'm interested in what they they experience. Yeah. Uh, I, I, I've only had two lucid dreams myself. And we should probably define it because there might be some short. people who, who don't know what we're talking about. Oh, uh, yeah, a lucid dream is one in which you... In the dream, you realize that it's a dream and you stay asleep, but you're awake in the dream. And now you can choose what happens if you want to. Some people just are passive and just just watch what happens, but are awake mm -hmm. in the dream. And others are actively involved in, in guiding, choosing. Uh, young people always like to fly. That's yeah. one one of the first things they want to do in lucid dreaming. I really like how Robert Wagner, in, in one of his, in the book, he talks about going up to a dream character and, and informing this dream character that this character was a, a, a character in Robert's dream. Hmm. And the character said, no, you are a character in my dream. Hmm. So now, Let's talk about this a little bit. That character, does it exist in another dimension? Is Robert 
going to another dimension and encountering an actual being or is this his own unconscious <laughs> who can say you I mean, you can say you know i i wouldn't i i up till now i haven't bothered with that because i think i have enough to do is to, without going off too far in in those directions but if you have the opportunity to interview robert i would highly recommend doing that but and this oh that would be good to interview is gary craig who's in, not gary craig um on oh, Sorry, I haven't gotten his name right. That's Gary okay. is the founder of EFT. EFT? Um, emotional freedom technology technique. Oh. No, we're we're sticking with Jungian analysts here on, on this right. podcast. But um, yes. yeah, so I think I'm I'm starting to wonder if this isn't kind of maybe a precursor to what's going on now since the pandemic, uh, we're all seeing each other virtually, just like you and I are doing. I mean, when I started this podcast in 2015, I was doing a lot of the interviews in person. Mm -hmm. I went to Santa Fe and interviewed Jerome Bernstein. I went to Toronto and interviewed Daryl Sharp. I went to Zurich wow. and I interviewed Murray Stein. And now we're, I can see you and you can see me, but I'm actually looking at a piece of glass, right? Yes. And so, these lucid dreams, I mean, it, I, I'm curious. I'm curious to know uh, if this is kind of like the virtual world or if this is, I mean, I guess I, I should be asking, how is a lucid dream different from what we were talking about earlier? Uh, what did you call it? A dream of like your everyday life? or even an archetypal, what Jung would call a big dream. Is there a difference? Um, well, the difference is that you're lucid. <laughs> um, so in, in, I used to do, when I got out of college, I worked in neurology at University Hospitals of Cleveland and I administered EEG exams on hmm. children and adults and we looked at brainwave activity. And so I know a little bit about the stages of sleep. Good. And so would the brain show that this person was awake during a lucid dream? There are lucid, I've seen reports recently of people who've had lucid dreaming in the non-REM phase. Okay. Uh, how that would look on the EEG, I have no idea. Okay. Yeah, I'm curious about that. So normal, I should... normal dreaming uh, in the REM phase looks just like being awake, as my in my understanding. <laughs> I'm wondering how that's different from a lucid dream, how that would look different in the brain. Me too. If yeah. you find out, please let me know. Okay. Okay. <laughs> So uh, we're going to leave this open because it doesn't sound like, as a Jungian analyst, you guys work with lucid dreams. H no, has an analysand ever brought you a lucid dream? No. 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 Do you think that they're not very common? They could well be common. I mean, lucid dreaming is quite common now. People are talking about it more and more, uh, especially among the young people. Yeah. Um, but they don't need therapy. <laughs> so, right. So if your dreams disturb you, then you might want to bring them to an analyst. Uh, if, if, yeah. and if you're curious, if you're just curious as to what's going on and, and was it, was it Jung who said there's a 2 million year old person inside you? Wouldn't you want to consult it from time to time? Like that. that Jung talked about his second personality, which who was was very old, yes, mm -hmm. and and would speak to you in dreams, yes. and yeah, and and our dreams have something to say. Uh, we as Jungians think so anyway, and and hopefully from what we've discussed here today, uh, you'll have an inkling of uh, for that. Um, but I want to end with. 
uh, a pilot study that you did. You published a paper, actually it was published just last year in October, titled The Effects of Near-Death Experiences on Dreaming. And uh, we covered near-death experiences a little bit in episode 84 with Dr. Jenny Yates in Wilmington, North Carolina. She is the co-editor with Professor Lee Bailey of the book, The Near-Death Experience. And you were looking at whether or not people who had those experiences, whether or not it affected their subsequent dreams. And what did you find? Uh, dreams uh, became, as a rule, not, not for everybody, but okay. as a rule, they, they became more spiritual. Mm. Their interest in dreams, the dream, their own dreams and in the dreams of others increased as a result. My, my, the question I was most interested in, uh, in uh, researching was, from the point of view who is having a near-death experience, what does dreaming look like? What mm. connection between us and this, the other side, so to speak? Yeah. What do dreams look like from the other side? And I didn't, I didn't get that information. Mm -hmm. But I offer this as, as a research topic for people. My, my, my study was just a, a, a pilot study yeah. with 10 quick questions and there's I think a lot more that could be done mm -hmm. and something I found interesting in it uh, you you cited uh, someone Zingrone's paper where they said that in 95% of the world's cultures there are references to near-death experiences 95% of the world's cultures and you had you had a near death experience. Yeah, tell us a little bit about that. It's recorded, and he talks about it in his his autobiography of memories, dreams, and reflections. Yeah, Ch chapter ten. I recently looked it up. Chapter ten. Okay. Uh, Jung suffered a heart attack and mm -hmm. was in the hospital, and while he was out in coma, he left his body and left the earth and discovered a temple which was orbiting the earth and he wanted to go in there and uh, because it contained contained all knowledge I, i'm doing this from memory i may not have got the details correct mm -hmm. but his doctor came up flying up from the earth in this experience and and told him to come back. He was yeah. still needed. Yeah. And Jung did rec uh, recover and, and so, but he, he, was, he was very worried about the doctor. <laughs> he was scared the doctor was now going to die. And in fact, the doctor did die uh, shortly afterwards. I would, um, trying to do something new here, where I can uh, share um, my screen. And I, I want to do it right now because I want to get better at it. Um, so uh, bear with me here. Um, let's see if this works. Did that work? Yes, yes it, did. Yeah. it did. So I just would like to let the listeners know that on our website, speakingofyoung.com, there is a page uh, called CG Young. So this is the website. Um, this is the front page of the website right now. Mm -hmm. And the menu goes across the top if you click on Young. Uh, here I've compiled as much information on Jung as I could find as far as a timeline of his life and work. And some of you might not be familiar or might not know the fact that Jung did suffer a heart attack. And in fact, I've seen in some places he's had two heart attacks. So see how it says here, 1944, first heart attack concurrent with a near death experience. That is, um, 
that is outlined in the book Memory Streams Reflections. And I'll provide links in the show notes uh, to that. And so as we're coming uh, up on the end of our time here, Dr. Funkhauser, I was wondering if um, you had anything else you would like to add here today um, before we pick up with the Deja experience next week. Um. One topic we didn't talk about, which we probably should have touched on, and yeah. that has to do with the difference between the objective level of dream meaning and the subjective level of dream meaning. Yeah, let's talk about that right now. Would you tell us a little bit more about it? Uh, some dreams provide you information about the outside reality, about people, places, and so on, that you uh, learn uh, for example, you can dream of, about a pretty woman and, and decide, yes, the dream says that would be a good person to date. Or it might show you uh, the car you were thinking to buy and the dream shows you, uh-uh, don't buy that car for right. me. It can give you information about the real world. On the subjective level, these characters in the dream are part of yourself mm. on the inner stage. And Jung divided them into four categories. The, the, the ones which we are happy with, those parts where he called the persona, that's our mask that we uh, let everybody see. But everyone also has a shadow side which they don't want people to see, and they might not even acknowledge themselves that they have side. And the danger is that this gets projected outward. Sure does. So it's very good if we learn about our inner shadow side. Mm -hmm. And then we have a side which is of the opposite sex. Um, so men have a feminine side as well, and which is uh, receptive and and uh, with feeling and emotion. And women have a more masculine side, which very often has to do with being more assertive, of uh, making their place in the world, and uh, sticking up for themselves and so on. Mm -hmm. uh, this, the feminists have criticized Jung for this categorization. So I don't, I don't know what the latest uh, way of talking about it is, but that's that's a very general uh, right. thing. And then there's a fourth figure which Jung called the self. Uh, mm. This is this is this wisdom that you mentioned earlier yeah. that shows up occasionally in our dreams, especially at junctures where we're not sure which way to go. We might then have a dream which gives us a hint or a push in in one of those directions, or maybe a whole new direction that we didn't even think of can also arise that way. We haven't touched on how creative dreams can be. Mm. There's a very important reason for having dreams. Okay. Is, for, is bringing in new, uh, new directions, new attitudes, even works of art, music, uh, poems, so many inspiration. Of, you mean inspiration great. for those things? Okay. Yes, all come from dreams. And I, I substitute. I've concluded that there is a a level in between the subjective and the objective, which I call the relationship level. Okay. If I dream that uh, some cousin has died. It could be on the objective level that, that that's really happened, mm -hmm. that the cousin has died. On the subjective level, it could mean that the part of me, which is like that cousin, has not received attention. Uh, it needs, I need to invest some energy in, in, in bringing this back to life in me, maybe. It depends on how I react. If I'm okay with him dying, then I can let that go. I don't need that in my psyche anymore for now. It can retire. Mm. Or if I'm very shocked, then, then oh, I, I've, not, I've been neglecting this part of myself, so I need to do that. That's the subjective level. And 
But that, I was just going to say, that's a great example of what you were talking about before, about needing the dreamer's input. And, and the relationship means I need to call my cousin and find out if he's alive, and this restores the relationship. Ah. We... Yeah. And so there's no hard and fast rule is what we're learning here today. That's right. And that's why uh, a w work with an analyst is so crucial to really getting to what is the dream trying to tell us? And, and still, even when working with an analyst, as you said before, there's more than one meaning to a dream. Yes. You can this is it. a lot of work. Yes. So when, when we do the, the dream work, as I teach in the seminar, we don't tell people what their dreams mean. We mm -hmm. say, if it was my dream, mm. it might mean this. Or my fantasy about your dream mm -hmm. is this. So that the dreamer can say, no, that's that doesn't resonate. That's, okay. That doesn't do it for me. And then you and, would keep going. And then the dreamer goes home in the evening, and while he's brushing or brushing the teeth, yeah. he says, Oh, now I know what that dream was about. Mm. But the work we did helped bring that. It makes the dream more important. And telling the dream, you 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 remember more details than you, you did at first, for example. So it can be very helpful. It doesn't have to be with an analyst, but it but it's I think it's better with an analyst. Mm. Someone who's trained and someone who has a lot of experience. And, and who will ask the, ask questions and help and not give uh, answers. <laughs> we'll ask questions and not give answers. And I actually, I, I wanted to mention this because I find this so interesting. I heard um, Marion Woodman once say, actually, it might be in one of her books. I think it's in Addiction to Perfection. She said sometimes it takes her or it's taken her 20 years to understand one of her dreams. Yeah. Yeah. I, I can well believe that. So the unconscious doesn't seem to know very much about time. Yeah, I keep hearing that. Yeah. So is there anything else before we wrap up? I didn't mean to rush you here at the end. I mean, please. I would just like to thank you for this opportunity to 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 tell all this things about what I find most fascinating. <laughs> well, thank you for joining us and and sharing all of that. And I would like to remind the listeners that a big part of this podcast is the website, speakingofyoung.com, where I will have links to Dr. Funkhauser's to, he has two websites, to his papers, to the books he's mentioned, to Jung's books. Uh, I've been working on that website since 2015. I'm continually adding to it. Everything is free that's on that website. All of the podcast episodes are free. Uh, the only advertising we do is as an Amazon associate. Um, we earn from qualifying purchases. So if you would like to help support the podcast, please purchase, uh, make your purchases on Amazon through our links. Um, so I will, I, I need you to stay with me here while I read the outro, but we will see you back here again next week. Mm -hmm. If you're willing, I hope so. Uh, where we're going to talk about your, your really your life's work, your research into the Deja experience, what that is, and you have an entire website devoted to it. It's so important. I'm so fascinated and so interested by it. So we will uh, see you back here again next week. Uh, mm -hmm. Until then, I'm just going to read the standard outro here and remind you once again to please visit our website, Speaking of Jung. That's J-U-N-G dot com for more information on everything discussed in this episode. There you'll also find all of the previous episodes of this podcast, which are available to stream or to download for free. Speaking of Jung is also available on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, and Amazon Music. And the video version of this episode is available on our YouTube channel, Jungian and Laura. So with special thanks to John and Nada O'Brien, to Anthony Peake, and to Joe Roop at the Fringe FM. 
This is Laura London, and you've been listening to Speaking of Young.